Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Cooney and I'm here today with my wife uh, Carrie Cooney who's off camera and together we're known as the Climbing Coonies and uh, this is I believe the sixth year that we've done a presentation for the Armchair Travelers series. Uh, our series today is going to focus on the San Rafael Swell which is a large area located about 15 miles east of Green River, Utah. It averages about 40 miles uh, wide and 75 miles long and this great anticline dome which is part of the Colorado Plateau was uplifted and tilted ages ago with the overlying layers of various sandstones and shales and limestones being thrust upwards and then weathered down to its present condition. The inexorable weathering has left behind a complex of canyons and gorges, valleys, high plateaus, slot canyons, buttes, badlands, and grasslands. In the middle of the anticline, the oldest rock layers are uplifted and exposed at an elevation of nearly 7,000 feet, while the younger layers are more evident on the perimeter down to about 4,500 feet. Interstate 70 serves as a divider between the southern and northern portions of the swell, and the entire feature is located in Emory County. On the east side of the swell, the uplifted sedimentary layers are thrust upwards in a really dramatic fashion, while the western slope of the anticline uh, angles downward at a more gentle rate. And there are two river systems that cut through the swell, the San Rafael River in the north and the Muddy River in the south. Neither river carries a very large volume today except in the runoff season or after exceptional flash floods. The swell has been home to ancient Indian tribes that date back thousands of years. More recent groups have left behind an abundance of pictograph and petroglyph uh, panels along with various artifacts. And the entire area is managed by the Bureau of Land Management. Much of it is open to a variety of uh, recreational opportunities but a total of 14 small wilderness areas have been set aside with limitations against motorized travel. Uh, many of the roads that exist were put in by uranium operations in the late 1940s uh, up into the 1960s. Today, the swell attracts a variety of outdoor recreationists and offers, offers opportunities for horseback riding, hiking, backpacking, canyoneering, rock climbing, camping, exploration, cattle and sheep grazing, and uh, plenty of roads for ATV users and four-wheel drivers uh, to uh, explore. The area has been used for some movie sets, including the 2009 Star Trek movie, Galaxy Quest. So we begin our program by taking you to some um, views of the swell. Um, this first one here is shot just north of I-70 and uh, is of that eastern side of the swell. When you're coming out of Green River and you're heading west on I-70, uh, you'll see this dramatic uplift. And so some of these slides here were just shot very recently and you can see some of these uplifted sandstone layers here. There are any number of small canyons that cut through these layers. They form an intricate complex of canyons to explore. And right here you can see I-70 as it heads up through the swell. If you're driving I-70 or never have driven this way before, as you approach this uplift, you'll be wondering where in the world is the highway going to take me? And this is some of the other geologic features you'll see as you approach the swell and some of the layering of those sandstone and layers, shale and limestone as well. Now, if you drive on up I-70, just a few miles, there's a couple of uh, uh, look at, overlook uh, pullouts that you can stop at. And so this particular photo right here is looking back down uh, through the swell, and you're seeing the backside of all of that dramatic uplift. And that view is back off toward Green River. Now, this is kind of a general map of the San Rafael Swell. And on this map, you can see I-70 here uh, cutting across the swell. And so this area up here we call the northern swell, and this area down here we call the southern swell. And the dramatic uh, rise of the swell is all along this eastern and southeastern flank. And that's where you find some of the most uh, impressive canyons. Some of those canyons uh, can be explored by ATV. Some of them are good for hiking, non-technical hiking. 
and others are quite technical. And today we're going to show you some of those canyons. Uh, this is a more detailed map, and the reason I'm pulling this one up, this is I-70 again, cutting through the swell. And right up in this area, there's an exit off the highway. And from that same exit, you can either take this road here and proceed into the northern swell, or you can proceed south. So the first set of slides we're going to show you uh, is going to take us down into this region here. And we're going to make kind of a driving loop. On this section of road up here, you're driving through a lot of dry wash. And you can loop back and then come back out on I-70. This is a geologic uh, cutaway map, if you will, of the San Rafael Swell. And over here on this side, uh, you can see where uh, the sudden rise of those geologic layers helps create uh, the dramatic, what we call a reef, a barrier. And the primary geologic layers that you see there are the Entrada, the Navajo, the Cayenta, the Wingate, uh, the Moencopi, and the Coconino, which uh, will show up more at the top of that uh, dramatic rise. So once you uh, drive up uh, from I-70 and take that exit, you'll be at some of the higher elevation of the San Rafael Swell. And up in that higher elevation, there are grasslands. And you'll find uh, wild horses, such as this one here, grazing. Or you might be lucky and see an antelope or two as well. Now, Here's a photo here as we're progressing down. The, uh, the, the road that takes you through here is a graded dirt road. It's uh, pretty good quality, uh, except when it rains. And then it can become quite muddy, and you probably don't want to be in there. And on this road here, we're progressing down toward the Muddy River. Muddy River runs along the base of these cliffs that you see here in the distance. There's another photo looking down in that direction. You can see a portion of the road over here on the left. And these are just some of the outstanding views that you'll enjoy. Uh, you'll also see abandoned relics from the uranium mining heyday uh, as you drive on down there. And again, the muddy river is down here at the base of those cliffs. And here in this particular photo, here's our road. And you can see in the distance at the base of the cliffs some trees and some green. And that's uh, the muddy river, and that's where uh, a large camp was set up in the 1950s for uranium mine, mining operations. And so here we're getting close down to those mines, and here's one of the mines right here. There are some historical markers uh, in this area that explain the mine operations. Uh, at one time, there were supposed to be several hundred people living in this area. They even had a small school. And again, most of that was during the 1950s. This is an arch that overlooks that area. You can see the nice cottonwood trees. It's a good place to stop midway if you're making this loop drive through there. And then as we begin to turn and head back out, uh, you'll continue to see more relics from the uranium mining days, like that old vehicle, or this rather interesting photo of just an old engine just laying out there on the desert floor. And as we're heading back, you'll see more vistas of some of the buttes and uh, taller hills in this area. Uh, there's a nice uh, classic western type of landscape that you'll have an opportunity to see. And that'll take you eventually back to I-70. Now the other uh, road that we mentioned takes off from the same location and uh, the exit is right here on Interstate 70, and this is a good quality graded dirt road that will lead you down, basically downhill for a number of miles until you cross the San Rafael River right down in this location here. There's a very nice campground there and uh, an interesting bridge that's built across. And then as you after you cross the river, you'll go uphill. And in the, uh, as you go along the road up here, there's a, a designated site of some pictograph panels by the Indians. And you can follow that road and then loop back around. And right in here is a, an overlook area called the Little Grand Canyon of the San Rafael River. And so we'll show you a few pictures of that area. 
This is the road that takes you on down, and so at the base of these cliffs is the San Rafael River, and the road is eventually going to lead all the way down there and then kind of cut up through this canyon that you can barely make out. Here's just another photo of the approach down to the San Rafael River. You'll see more towers and buttes like uh, you see right here. And then uh, this photo is down at the San Rafael River, so uh, what looks like just a small creek over here uh, toward the bottom left of the photo, that's actually the San Rafael River, uh, which we mentioned before doesn't carry a great deal of volume or flow um, except in uh, runoff season. Here's, uh, we mentioned the pictograph panels. Uh, you can stop there. They have it, uh, some uh, trail signs that expl explain about the uh, pictograph panels here when they think they were uh, probably put in by Indian groups. And these are just some of the samples that you'll see at that panel. I'd like to understand what this one is here, but nobody seems to know how to translate these into another language. So once you get up there on top of the rim that overlooks the Little Grand Canyon of the San Rafael, this is the kind of view that will greet you. And we were in here, I think about three years ago, and we spent one uh, afternoon and evening uh, photographing the area, and then uh, also stayed into the next morning as well to get some morning photography done. In this particular photo, you can see the San Rafael River all the way down here at the bottom of the canyon. Uh, you're looking in elevation change here is about 800 vertical feet. Another evening shot, looking back, uh, most of these shots are generally looking east because of the uh, sun beginning to set in the west. And here's a uh, sunrise over the canyon. Uh, it's a beautiful place to visit. We might also mention that there's a uh, very nice and uh, fairly well-known uh, mountain bike trail that follows all along the rim of the canyon. And uh, if you're interested in mountain biking, this is a great location to come and take the family. Uh, most of the trail is suitable for younger kids as well. Now we're going to take you over to the eastern flank of the San Rafael Swell where we talked about that uh, dramatic rise that you see and the number of canyons that cut up through there. Uh, here's one a canyon that terminates at a uh, kind of a, a whole type of arch in the ceiling of the uh, cutaway or undercut section of the canyon. And on, on the way up there, there are more pictograph type panels that can be viewed. And you can find these kind of panels in various locations all throughout the swell. Now, lying outside technically of the San Rafael Swell, but very close by, is a Utah State Park called Goblin Valley. And Goblin Valley has uh, facilities for camping, they have a large parking area, and this is a really delightful area to explore, and it is particularly good for children who will have just a, a great time uh, climbing around on all of the goblin rock formations that you see here. Uh, this park is divided up into three main uh, coves or sections where you'll find all of these goblins. And you can see there's just a high number of them to explore. This is a great place to come to on a full moon night and uh, play hide and seek out here or a game of capture the flag. I call this five little goblins. And there's very little vegetation, but uh, if you come in the springtime, you may catch a few flowers in there for photographic effect. And as you can see, we were visiting here uh, when these shots were taken on a full moon and uh, trying to play around just a little bit for, with some uh, photographic ideas. Now, uh, on the perimeter of Goblin Valley, uh, there's a, a cave that's located there. And you can get to that cave by taking a two-mile hike outside the park around the perimeter, and then you can come in through the entrance of this cave where you see that light coming in. 
and uh, clamber over the boulders. Um, but that's not how we chose to enter it uh, this particular day. Um, if you'll see here, uh, my wife is standing there and she's looking up in the ceiling. There's a hole up there. And you can also rappel down into this cave, about an 80 foot rappel uh, dropping down. It's a very dramatic kind of thing to do, very fun. And uh, we had the good fortune of hitting it just in time with all the light coming in. And this is some of more of the uh, terrain right around Goblin Valley. Another one of the goblins or hoodoos. And then just a few more miles to the uh, southwest from Goblin Valley State Park, there's a very popular slot canyon called Little Wild Horse. And Little Wild Horse can be uh, completed as a loop along with another canyon called Bell. Little Wild Horse has more narrows in it and so it's a little more entertaining to do, but both of them are quite scenic and the loop can be completed in about four to five hours by a group that uh, keeps moving. So these shots are taken several years ago in Little Wild Horse Canyon. There's some of our family practicing their some basic uh, canyoneering technique here, what's, what's called stemming. Uh, I do want to add a, a caution here. Uh, that is, just in this last year, tragedy struck when a, uh, a kind of a rogue thunderstorm in the spring hit this area and uh, created a significant flash flood and two young children died in that flood. So never go into these canyons, uh, any of the ones that we're going to show you here, if there are thunderstorms or heavy rains that are in the forecast. Just stay out. This part of the canyon here gets kind of winding and twisting, and you see a lot of uh, interesting formation in the sandstone here. Uh, if you time it right and the sun is right, you may be able to catch some dramatic lighting. And as you can see in this photo, there's some very interesting shapes that you'll encounter, uh, layering in the sandstone and weathering that has occurred. This right here is actually an old piece of wood, probably a, a piece of a juniper tree that's been washed down the canyon and then it's been scoured by uh, probably multiple flash floods and smoothed away. And up here our family is uh, having a little fun in these pockets that develop in the canyon walls. These are called solution pockets and the solution pockets are where uh, the sandstone was probably softer and eroded a little more quickly than the surrounding sandstone around it. And as you can see, uh, this uh, canyon can be quite suitable for young children who like to explore in it, and uh, older children as well. And here's family again, entering one of the narrow sections of the canyon. Uh, here's another one of the more interesting sections where the canyon winds and twists around. And again, if you're here with the correct lighting, uh, you can get some very dramatic effect in here. And up here, we're starting to exit the narrow section of the canyon. Uh, there will be places where it widens out. You can have a, a lunch there or whatever. And uh, play around a little bit, as you see in this photo here. Then you can uh, exit back down through Bell Canyon. There's still a little bit of opportunity to do some uh, canyon technique, but for the most part, Bell Canyon is wider, like you see here in this photo. And that's the end of uh, that particular series. Um, right in the middle of the swell is a, a very large and significant canyon called Eagle Canyon. And uh, the interstate highway uh, bridges that canyon and here you can see both the east and westbound lanes of the interstate. The canyon is open to four-wheel drive and ATV vehicles. On the day that we uh, got it down into this canyon, we entered through a side canyon. Um, this photo is just to give you a little perspective. There's an 18-wheeler up there on that bridge. So we entered through a, a side canyon, and it required a little bit of technical work. We had to do a couple of repels. Um, and then we eventually wound up in the bottom of Eagle Canyon here. And this was getting to the time of year where there was a little bit of fall developing, so you can see it in the color in that one shrub there. 
there's some very tall um, Douglas fir and uh, ponderosa pine trees up at this elevation. This is actually a higher elevation section of the swell. Now, another canyon hike, interesting canyon hike that's a little further southeast uh, along the uh, San Rafael Reef is a, a loop called Cistern and Ramp Canyons. And so in this particular photo here, we are starting out going down Ramp Canyon. This is looking back up the canyon a little bit. Some of the obstacles you have to work your way around and through. Canyon does narrow up some, but it never gets really tight and is generally considered non-technical except for this one problem right here, which is a large chalk stone that's gotten wedged into a narrow section of the canyon. If you can look real carefully, you can see a person's legs right down here, and another person is actually wedged up in that dark area, and that's how we descended around this rock, by kind of squeezing in there and dropping down. Uh, going up this uh, particular obstacle is much more challenging than going down it. And then as you head on down the canyon, um, you eventually drop down into some interesting sandstone formation. Uh, this was of particular interest because this almost looks like uh, wood, a uh, burl wood or some kind. Uh, we took that photo and enhanced it just so that you could see uh, the, the very unique layers that occur and the way that they're all twisted and everything. Interesting geologic forces at work there. So now we've uh, gotten to the bottom of Ramp Canyon and we're following out this uh, dry wash. You, you can see the tilted beds of the bottom of the San Rafael Swell. And we're gonna uh, go uh, along the bottom of the swell a couple of miles and then we're gonna head up Cistern Canyon. Along the way, you may spot some nice wildflowers. And this is what the uh, bottom of the swell looks like when you're doing this hike along Cistern and Ramp. So still dramatic uplift here, several other canyons cutting through. Just all kinds of geologic layers apparent. So now we're heading back up uh, Cistern Canyon. And sometimes you may encounter some uh, potholes filled with water when you do this, uh, either find a way through them or be prepared to wade through them. And this is a section of rock where there's just hundreds and hundreds of solution pockets. It looks kind of honeycombed. And then as uh, Cistern Canyon begins to open up, it goes up what we call behind the reef where the main upthrust is. And as you walk behind there, this road takes you across. Uh, when we did this particular hike, we found that uh, there was an area of recent rockfall. So you can see how this entire section of cliff broke away. And just to give you a little perspective of it, here's to my wife and a, and a friend of ours. And you can see the size of those giant boulders that came crashing down from that rockfall. And as we're getting back to our car, we enjoy some nice views here. All of this layering here and that more intense rusty red color is called the Moenkopi uh, layer, geologic layer. And uh, it has a high concentration of iron oxides that probably contribute to that color. And this is uh, near the end of this particular hike as we're getting back to our vehicle. Now there are uh, two other canyons that we wanted to show you that uh, require more technical expertise to negotiate. The first canyon is called Quandary. Second one is called Knotted Rope. These two canyons uh, both exit the swell on that southeast side down near the Muddy River, and uh, they tend to parallel each other. Uh, Quandary Canyon, well, both canyons are actually noted for having what are called keeper potholes. Keep a pothole in a, in a canyon is an area where the water action over the uh, centuries, along with combined rocks and gravel, has scoured out a hole in the canyon floor. Sometimes these holes can be so deep, so scoured out, and the walls so smooth that uh, if you went into that hole, you may not be able to ever get out unless you have some kind of plan to do so or a rope or a setup of rope to help yourself get out. So on this, uh, Progression here, we're going up into Quandary Canyon. 
Uh, Quandary Canyon is um, located near, uh, and both uh, Quandary and Knotted Rope are located near the Hidden Splendor Mine, which probably achieved more uh, fame during that uranium mining era than any of the other mines in the area. So while some uranium was being mined in the swell prior to the 1950s, the development of the atomic bomb during World War II and in the following Cold War brought about a rush uh, to mine and deliver large quantities of uranium to the U.S. government. So a major boom occurred in the late 1940s and 1950s and it ended in about the mid-1960s. Several mines became prominent um, in this area during that time and one of the better known was the Hidden Splendor Mine. Perhaps the most celebrated find, with the exception of the Temple Mountain ore body, was Vernon J. Pick's location of the Delta Mine, that was his original name, later became known as the Hidden Splendor, and he uh, began operating that in 1952. After profitably working uh, the mine, his claim for about two years and uh, extracting over a million dollars worth of ore, uh, Pick sold the workings of the mine to the Atlas Corporation for a total sum of nine million dollars. Unfortunately, Atlas only recovered about $2 million worth of ore in the next three years and eventually closed the mine in 1957. In 1956, the uh, Atomic Energy Commission announced that the supply of stockpiled uranium had reached the uh, level of plenty and producers were advised not to expand their operations anymore. By 1960, virtually all the uranium prospect prospecting in the county uh, uh, to be carried out but was just being carried out by a few select prospectors and in, in total nearly 50,000 claims for uranium mines were filed during that boom cycle. So here we are heading down Quandary Canyon. Uh, this is getting into one of the first narrow sections and this is where we find our first obstacle. We're expecting uh, water in this canyon. In fact, uh, less than two days before it had rained heavily in this area, so we expected the potholes to be filled with water, and in this photo we put on wetsuits. But after that first obstacle, we find that the canyon opens, widens that back out for a while. We find this nice bridge span across the canyon, a little bit of a mud hole down there. Look at this looking back at it. And now we're getting into the more technical section of the canyon. And here we are uh, dropping down into one of the potholes. On this particular one, it was more just uh, slide down through the crack and drop in and throw your pack down ahead of you. And here's a series of shallow potholes here. Another section of some of the potholes, and in this uh, particular slide, we're getting ready to, to uh, rappel down into one of the more major potholes found in the canyon. This is looking back at another one of the potholes that we had to drop down into and swim across. And this is yet another one of the major potholes in the canyon. Uh, this is getting down near the bottom of the canyon, and once we get down at the bottom, uh, we're down at the bottom of the reef, and so we hike back along the base of the swell, and the exit for Quandary Canyon, the shortest way back up to your vehicle, is back up through that ramp canyon that we previously mentioned. So this photo here shows our group hiking along the base of the swell, and you can see the beautiful, colorful layers that represent multiple geologic ages. And the last canyon that we'll take you to is called Knotted, Knotted Rope. And this canyon too starts up here at a higher elevation in the swell and drops all the way down to the bottom of the swell. And the Hidden Splendor Mine was based in, over here kind of on the extreme right of, of the uh, photo. And that's where much of the ore was dug and extracted. Interesting that as you descend this canyon, you'll see a, a small pipe that runs most of the length of the canyon, which the, uh, uh, the miners use to transport water from below up to the mining operation above. 
So as we're hiking to the beginning of the canyon, here we are looking out across the uh, southern swell, and you can see all the layering of that Molenkopi uh, geologic layer. Very colorful, very intricately eroded. Along the base of the cliffs there is the Muddy River. You can see the, one of the main roads that services this area. Uh, you can reach uh, all the way down to an airstrip in here and the Hidden Splendor Mine area, typically in a two-wheel drive type vehicle. Another one of the views, outstanding color, outstanding scenery in, at the beginning of this hike. There's my wife uh, looking out across it. And over here, you can see the uh, course of the muddy river cutting along the base of the cliffs. So right here, we're kind of at the head of the canyon. You can see where it's starting to narrow down and we're getting ready to progress down the canyon. And here's a friend that uh, went with us this day. We might mention we, we did this hike in uh, early April, so it's still pretty chilly up in the higher section of the swell. And the night before we did this canyon, it had gotten down to uh, freezing temperatures. So the water that you can see in this photo was very cold that morning. Okay, we're going to show you a short video here that just gives you an idea of what it's like to try to progress through a narrow section of the canyon. Uh, I won't make any other comment beyond this point while you watch the video. Just working on another canyoneering video or presentation? <laughs> Who knows? Or one's enough. <laughs> Keep going. Okay, and here's a still photo kind of of that same section of the canyon where you can see one of the members of our party uh, progressing through all that winding and twisting section. And here's another video uh, that will give you a little bit of idea of what it's like to have to drop down into one of these potholes. The particular pothole you see here is uh, over our heads, so we call it a swimmer. And as we mentioned before, it was quite cold this day. So, and, and there was a little bit of wind blowing, so it makes the sound a little bit uh, difficult to understand here. All right, so at this point, we've continued on down through most of the major potholes, and we're continuing on down the canyon. 
and we come across this uh, giant sand dune. This, this sand dune is probably a good 75 feet in height. And if you hike up to the top of the sand dune, you can look down through a break in the canyon wall, and down here below, you can see the uh, muddy river. And at this point, we're still about 400 feet above that river. So we continue, here's the sand dune, and we continue on down the canyon here. And as we do so, there's another opportunity to look through a break in the canyon wall and see the muddy river below. And right here, we have an outstanding view of the bottom of the swell, and you can see the uplifted layers that have been eroded away over the uh, millennia. And here's the uh, last section of potholes as we get close to the, closer to the bottom of the canyon. Uh, nice little series right here. Most of these are all shallow and not particularly difficult, or you can walk off to the side around them. And here's my wife, Carrie, uh, pulling herself up out of the very last pothole in Knotted Rope Canyon. And then we just need to walk down this hillside and get down to the bottom of the swell, and we're going to head off to the right uh, that you see in this photo and intercept the muddy river. And then to complete the, uh, the loop, we're going to hike three miles back up the muddy river. And uh, this last photo here of our presentation gives you an idea of what it's like to hike along that. Muddy River is never particularly deep or anything, uh, but we leave our wetsuits on and several occasions we have to wade across the river. And that completes our journey down through Knotted Rope Canyon. Uh, we thank you for joining us for this presentation and uh, you're more than welcome to uh, contact us uh, through our two websites, either climb13ers.com or highestgroundphotography.com. Thank you again for joining us. We appreciate the opportunity to make this presentation for you.